Hello YouTube, my name is Zach, and today I'm going to be taking a step back through memory lane and reanalyzing Devin Townsend. Now I'm doing this because Annika, who I last did a vocal analysis on, actually shared my last video on Facebook, and so I figured that's going to bring about a lot of Annika fans and possibly some new Devin Townsend fans and things, so I figured I'd go back and revisit. When I first made the Devin video, I wasn't that great at recording. It was the first time I'd ever done like the analysis format, so the video wasn't as good, and I want to kind of redo it with my more current sort of format and iteration of doing videos. That being said, here's a quick disclaimer. This video is made strictly for educational purposes. This is not a reaction video. I've already thoroughly analyzed Devin prior to this recording. I'm a professional voice teacher at a music studio in Atlanta, Georgia, and I've taught hundreds of voices, both male and female, in most genres from the ages of 5 to 60. I base my analyses upon academically sourced health-based principles. If you want to learn a bit more about the basis of my pedagogy, I encourage you to check out nats.org and peruse the journal of singing. It's been the authoritative source of all things vocal pedagogy related in the United States for the past 75 years. Artistry and technique are equally important in singing, and throughout my research of the YouTube landscape, I found that there is a much greater emphasis on artistry across the board than technique, and I aim to counterbalance that with some more objective commentary. As such, my videos tend to de-emphasize the artistic intention of the singer. My doing so does not invalidate the singer's skill or efficacy in displaying his or her artistic ideals, but perhaps instead offers a different lens by which to view the process of singing and phonation. I seek out what I call teachable moments. And as a result, this video will contain both praise and constructive criticism. I humbly encourage you to view these critiques from a strictly educational paradigm and not as an affront on Devin himself. My goal ultimately is to help you learn about your own singing. Now, before I get started, I'm going to go ahead and give a quick overview and sort of give you the three strengths and the three weaknesses of Devin singing in this particular clip. Devin's three biggest strengths, I would say, from a synopsis of this video and of his singing as a whole, is that one, he has nearly impeccable pitch, no matter which method of phonation he's using, which is extremely unusual. Uh, he's able to create multiple dimensions of sound with his voice or what we call vocal colors. And he navigates into and out of the vocal mix with ease, which is something that a lot of people struggle with, especially bear Baritones. And for the three weaknesses, I would say, first off, he uses some methods of consistent phonation that tend to be physically destructive to the mechanism like his rasp and his like breathy and airy approach. Uh, he also uses extraneous and or unnecessary force and tension to create some of the sounds. And he also has a tendency to use hard glottal onsets. This is Hyperdrive from EMG TV. I'm going to have to split the video up. I'm sorry, it has to do with copyright rules. I can't just play the video through. Actually, I first learned this when I did my first Devin video and I found that it got blocked as soon as I uploaded it. So I have to split things up more. I'm sorry, I wish I didn't have to, but that's just how it is. Here we go. So cold in the night where the river flows. So the first thing I want to point out here is that you're hearing a very aspirate sort of sound on his voice. It's almost this kind of airy, wispy thing. And so what Devin is doing here is he's allowing more air to pass through the folds, pass through the vocal mechanism in order to create this specific sound that he's trying to attain. Now, this is not the only way that Devin sings. Sometimes he won't use the airy sound. Sometimes he does use the airy sound. One of the main reasons that I chose this particular video is because it does demonstrate Devin's ability to use multiple vocal colors or different types of sounds in his voice. Now, that has a lot to do with the artistry of singing. And as my disclaimer says, I try not to delve into the artistry as much because artistry is more about the intent of the singer. And I, I can't tell you what his exact intentions are behind delivering a sound a specific way. However, I can tell you what the byproducts and the reasoning for the sound being created is. And so in this case, whenever you hear that airy, wispy, sort of aspirate sound, what you're actually hearing is a separation of the vocal folds in the mechanism. Typically when you speak or when you sing, the folds fully close and they vibrate at a specific frequency. Well, when you use rasp or when you use airy sounds, anything like that, what tends to happen is the folds separate and the extraneous air coming through passes through the folds alongside the process of them trying to phonate and or vibrate. A good way to think about it is if you blow up a balloon and then you hold the balloon and then you kind of use the tip of it and pull and you can kind of let the air out slowly and you can sort of change the pitch of that little silly sound that it makes. Um, and then if you just let the balloon go, it'll, you know, all over the place and you'll have the balloon flying everywhere and the air will just be coming out left and right. The vocal mechanism functions very similarly. 
when you naturally phonate, there's this slight buildup of pressure underneath the glottis, underneath the vocal folds, and a vibration happens at whatever pitch that the folds have stretched enough to create. But when you allow more air through, the folds kind of just flap sort of willy-nilly and only loosely vibrate around the pitch. Now, this goes back to the first point that I made earlier, that it's remarkable that Devin has such incredible pitch. And I've found that across the board, everything that he does, it's on pitch all the time. I, I've even tried to see if some of his materials pitch corrected or auto tune, but it's really not. His pitch is just that good, and that's really hard to find in singers. But going back to the process of the phonation, when he makes this sound, the folds don't fully close when they vibrate. What happens is that areas of the folds have to take on extra work. Usually when you sing or phonate, there's an even distribution of work across the folds. They fully close and the vibration can be distributed. When they don't fully close, there's sort of this like disparity between the amount of work that each section of the fold is having to do. And what can happen is if you consistently sing or phonate this way, you can like develop vocal nodules. Uh, it can cause all sorts of vocal injuries, but nodules are probably the, the most common thing that form. I, I use John Mayer as an example all the time because he's just the easiest example to use. But he's a huge, huge example of someone who used too much air too often, too frequently, and it's damaged his voice. He's had surgeries and things. Now, now Devin's a special case in that he's kind of been able to mitigate some of these things, but he has had his own share of vocal issues in the past as well, as he's pointed out in interviews from some of the methods he's phonated and doctors have told him, hey, you can't do this, and he's had to take time off and whatnot. So just because Devin is able to do it doesn't mean that it's healthy across the board, and I would not recommend to, to most singers to phonate in this fashion consistently. Now, if you're using this as just an effect temporarily, there's totally nothing wrong with it. You're not going to wreck your voice from just using it as an effect, but singing with a breathy, raspy, airy sound is usually no good when you do it for long periods of time. In the night Now, one thing that's working to his advantage here is that these specific phrases that he's singing are very short. When you use this really raspy, airy sound, it actually uses more air as well, so your vocal efficiency is a little bit disrupted by that. If I talk like this, then I really can't. I can't last very long without running out of air. So when you speak without the airiness, the air flows out in a more evenly distributed way and you can make phrases last longer. So he's worked this to his advantage because he probably realizes that if he's pushing all this air out at once, he won't be able to sing a consistent phrase. So that's good that he's able to find a way to sort of mitigate that potential issue. Now, what he's doing here is pretty interesting because he's kind of parlayed this like airy sound into a little bit of a vocal mix. And I know that there's a lot of confusion about what the mix is and what the mix isn't. And it's honestly way beyond the scope of this video to just go in depth about it. But ultimately, the mix is sort of the place in between our head voice and our modal register or our chest voice. There's like this little gap of pitches that can kind of serve as a buffer from going into from going from our modal register up into our head voice or our falsetto and he's done a pretty good job of being able to take that airy sound and make it a mix and it makes it almost have a falsetto ish sound about it and typically when you use your mix voice it does that kind of thing even if i use a mix voice on like in, a, in like an operatic setting like you know if i'm going to use sort of like a, a hook as we call it oh if i go up and do that kind of thing it, it kind of still has that sort of airy quality and that really has to do with the what's happening with the folds like I said, it's really complicated and I don't want to bore you all to tears with it. But basically what's happening is the folds are sort of peeling back at certain places on the top and bottom to create tiny little pockets of air that push through. It keeps the middle of the folds connected together and, and vibrating and phonating. But that little extra pockets of air that come through at the top and the bottom, they kind of relieve the pressure off of the folds a little bit. They allow the, the folds to kind of stretch a little bit more and move up into higher ranges. Ultimately, I say all that to point out that he's done a pretty nice job of being able to sort of use his airy sound and make it a part of his mix voice. So that works in his favor and it, it makes some sense considering that the airiness is coming from this like separation of the folds anyway. Trying to find a new way. One thing that I kind of want you to look out for is when he's singing these choruses like this, eventually you're going to start hearing this kind of subtle, like uh, almost a creaking sound 
creep into the singing. And that's usually a sign of vocal fatigue. And it's very common to see in the airy, like breathy stuff, you see, you see a lot of fatigue come through. And now don't worry, this whole video isn't going to be harping on the airy stuff, the wispy stuff, because he does other things. But that is one of the primary components of his singing in this video. So it's definitely worth pointing out. With your river song. Sing See, he's clearly utilizing this airy sound as, as a way to create an affect along with the entirety of the song. And so I want to take a second to point out that, like I said in the disclaimer, there's nothing wrong with using what we would consider like unhealthy or suboptimal technique in terms of, you know, creating an effect or creating a vocal color. And and so Devin in his singing, he, he uses rasp in his like louder stuff all the time. He uses air, breathy sounds when he's singing softly. And then he can choose not to do any of it and do what you all would probably refer to as clean singing. He does all of that. So if you're making stylistic choices, it's okay. You just don't want to make a habit out of singing these methods all the time because you're causing the voice to do things that it sort of doesn't do on its own. And there's a lot of talk about healthy ways to do rasp or healthy ways to do breathy vocals. But a lot of that is speculation and the things that we do have science behind or any kind of peer review or study behind, a lot of them haven't been independently peer reviewed and, and a lot of it is just sort of like up for debate still. So uh, I've talked to some other singers, like I've spoken with Matt Barlow and, and several different singers from throughout the metal genre over the past few months. And, and I've come to the conclusion, I'm not a scientist, but I've come to the conclusion that a, a lot of the ability to do the rasp stuff sustainably and, and the ability to do some sort of the airy stuff sustainably comes from genetics because I've seen so many cases of people following these like healthy or you know, safe, correct ways of doing these types of vocals and they have damage and issues as if they had no training at all. So I think some people are just more naturally built for their vocal folds to take more abuse than others. And so that's why I advocate that it's best to have a safe baseline approach to singing. And then you can go out and explore all you want. Once you've got, you know, the safe stuff as a baseline, you can always go back to it. And I think Devin's done that for the most part, even though he does openly admit that a lot of his singing just comes as a result of, of force. It's important though that you keep in mind that his ability to create these vocal colors and his ability to use all these different sounds is, is a very unique characteristic of his voice. And a lot of singers strive to attain that throughout their whole careers and, and never do. So it's a really good thing. He, he's kind of taking more of the vocalist's approach than the singer, strictly singer's approach, which is really nice. Shut it! So yeah, I mean, that little shout there clearly was an example of him taking that breathy stuff off and he's going back on the voice and it was a little more aggressive and, you know, kind of had that edge raspy thing going on. But it's just a clear example of him going from being, you know, wispy, airy to on the voice. And it shows that he can deviate vocal colors if he wants to. So there he actually used his modal register. Oh, he started out in his modal register on the voice, didn't use the airy thing, and then he kind of moved that into a mix on the tail end of the phrase. Oh, it kind of like that, where you, you start out on the voice and you you make the falsetto move in at the same time. And it's, it's kind of a technique that you have to build. Like when I work with students, we do a lot of work or that kind of thing where you can start on like a high octave, Oh, and you can make like this smooth transition down. Eventually it takes time. It's not something you're going to be able to do the first time you try it. But ultimately the goal is you start in your head voice, you move your way down and you make the transition into the chest voice as seamless as possible. And so that's an example of him navigating those vocal colors that I talked about really, really well. Yeah. Yes, the, oh, that is an example of him actually taking the placement, moving it a little bit back. The, the O vowel sounded very open and resonant. Well, that's what happens when you kind of move the placement back. A lot of the singing that he's been doing up to this point has been sort of frontal, mid-mouth, which means that it doesn't have like a very open characteristic. It's going to sound a little bit uh, maybe thinner, maybe sometimes brighter, but not as big and open. But when you hear him do that big O vowel, the reason it sounds more resonant and full is because it's on the voice and because he places it a little further back in his mouth. And I think on the first Devin video I did, I pointed out something similar. He was very good at getting these open vowels. And so 
Um, really nice. That's a really good example, again, of him using multiple vocal colors. And, and it's definitely worth the praise that he gets for it because it's just a unique and uncommon trait for a vocalist. Hold on. Okay, now this is just a guess. This is kind of just an interpretation, so I may not be right. This is just sort of an opinion. But I think that based on the subject matter of the song, he's using the the, the wisp to kind of convey that. A lot of times, though, you run into singers that just do the airy stuff because that's all they know. If he's using it, in, as I suspect, to convey an idea behind the text, then that's what an example of what we would call text painting. And you can use text painting in everything from the way that it's composed. Like you can compose something to on the word high, you can have the note be higher. Or I mean, there's all sorts of ways you can do text painting, but if he is indeed utilizing the breathiness to convey an idea in the text of the music, then that's an example of text painting. And I just wanted to point that out. I might be way off, I might be wrong, but it's just a guess. So cool. So I know I stopped it again really soon, but that was really worth pointing out. I want you to listen. You're gonna hear us like, uh, kind of coming in the middle of it. I want you to listen to this. So cool. So right there on Cole, uh, you hear this thing kind of creeping in. That's a sign of vocal fatigue. The folds are just kind of flapping together and it's making this sort of like raspy sound. Now that's different from applied rasp. When you hear that sound come through in the phonation and it's not something that's deliberately intentional, it's like an incidental sound, that's usually a sign that the vocal folds are getting a little bit tired. And you see that in every genre. Even if I'm practicing my classical rep, like if my voice starts getting tired, I'll start hearing that uh, like kind of thing or I'll start flipping up into my head voice when I shouldn't be stuff like that when the voice starts giving like signs you can hear of like resistance of what it's doing that's usually a sign of fatigue you'll hear that a couple more times throughout the rest of this video as well I'll point them out when they come up right there so it caught it again say you heard that little say that eh, kind of come through that's an example of fatigue and you wouldn't think that singing with air like this would cause vocal fatigue but it absolutely does and i guarantee you that if he does any more singing in his sets when he does these types of songs he doesn't do a bunch of breathy stuff back to back i mean i can distinctly remember when i was in college a lot of choral music when I sing in choirs, you have to create certain effects because of this, the piece that you're performing. And I can distinctly remember times where we would have to sing with like an airy sound or like, oh, like something like that along with what we were singing. And I know that I got so tired so quickly and I would try to get that over with as soon as possible. Like I could not wait for us to be done with those sections because I get very tired. So singing through an entire song using that airy stuff can definitely wear your voice out fast. Take it from me, someone who, when I was in college, I was, sometimes I was singing four hours a day. And when we did breathy, airy stuff was always the worst. Uh, I promise. It's very fatiguing. So it's not like Devin is you know, doing something wrong. I mean, he's clearly choosing to make this sound, but you're starting to hear some signs in his voice that his body's telling him, hey, dude, this is, you know, not the most uh, comfortable thing in the world. Right there, too, on in the end of the vowel hey. And I know this seems like over-analysis, but it's all worth pointing out. I want you to hear these things just so that you know it's not a one-off. Like, it just happened once, and that's it. It's a consistent thing. Every day's a new day. <laughs> I'm stopping it over and over, but there's a lot here. On um, every day, he did what's called a hard glottal onset. He went every day. <laughs> Every. So yeah, I've talked about this in prior videos. The hard glottal onset is when the folds have a buildup of pressure underneath them. And when you phonate a word that begins with a vowel, they pop together as the release of pressure. And what this can end up doing is it can end up creating nodules. There's three forms of onsets that are most commonly used. You've got the modal, which is where if I said the word every, 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 with just an E that's very soft at the beginning, but on the voice, that's, an, that's a modal onset. Your aspirate onset is if I went every, kind of like the airy things that he's singing. And then the glottal would be... <laughs> Every, like that. So the three different forms of onsets are, are definitely worth pointing out and knowing about. The modal onset is completely normal, natural, healthy, no problems. The aspirate onset isn't going to kill your voice, uh, but it does use way more air than when you use a modal. Um, but it's not going to destroy your voice in the long run if you begin phrases with the... Uh, 
or something like that. It won't kill you. It's just a habit that that makes you tend to sing less efficiently. And then there's the glottal onset, which I just point out and explained that that is destructive over time. And I'd say that most of the pop singers that I see that have vocal issues, that have vocal problems, it use these glottal onsets. And there's even teachers out there, even on YouTube, that advocate for these glottal onsets. They call them like putting edge on the voice, and that's one of the terms I've used, or using hard glottal strokes, stuff like that. I hear people advocating for that. I would strongly recommend you ignore that because that is a method that is destructive. It does create a specific sound that you may want to create, but I would definitely avoid making hard glottal onsets a habit in your singing. Right there, you heard that like kind of like raspy thing come through there too. That's a definitely sign that this is his voice is getting a little bit tired of doing the the airy thing. A new way. That was another hard glottal on set there too. So that's two examples of that as well. Now. I know that it seems like I'm just bashing him. I want to point out I love Devin Townsend. I've loved him for years. I'm a big fan of his. And I have to do this to all sorts of singers in these videos. I mean, this is what I do for a living. I've break down all my favorites. I mean, you go through my history in my videos and you'll find all sorts of singers that I love that I've done this exact same thing to. And I do that because it's it's my job. You know, this is, this is what I do when students come into my studio. They are looking for insight on how to make their voices better, how to make their voices healthier, that kind of thing. And these are the kind of things that I point out and that I help people fix. A lot of the time, people don't even know that they're doing it. Like, I, I bet if Devin came and talked to me, he'd either say, well, I did that on purpose. I know it's bad for you. Or I wasn't even aware that I was doing that. So uh, that's the case like 90% of the time. And it's no fault of the singer at all. There's nothing wrong with the singer. It's just we develop habits by practicing. And, and next thing you know, we don't even know that it's become a part of everything that we do. And we don't know that it's destructive. The amount of education on the voice out there isn't that great. So because of that, it's easy to slip into bad habits without even realizing it. So it's not a knock on Devin at all. That's it. Pretty short little video, but it did a lot to demonstrate multiple elements of Devin's sound. And I don't want the viewers here to think that this is all that Devin can do. It's not. There's a whole bevy of content that Devin Townsend has done throughout his career covering multiple genres and multiple sounds and multiple approaches to singing. To call him prolific would be an incredible understatement and disservice to him as a musician. The guy is one of the most brilliant artistic individuals I've ever encountered in music, period. And so I'm willing to give him a little bit of leeway and credence in the sense of like, maybe he's doing these vocal habits because he has an artistic idea. And that's important to keep in mind. My general opinion, only opinion, that's it. I'm not trying to make any statements to be taken as fact or anything like that. Is that he is one of the most talented singers in metal. Possibly in contemporary music, period. And it goes to show that you don't have to have perfect technique to be a great performer and a great artist. But it's still worth knowing these things and it's still worth having someone there to point them out so that if you don't intend on making these choices with your voice, you can avoid them because there's just no reason to damage your voice if you don't intend to, right? I mean, if he wants to do things raspy and heavy his whole career, he's done that and that's fine. You know, something's worked out for him. At, at various times in his career, he's had vocal breakdowns. He's had to take breaks and he's had to you know consult with professionals and somehow or another he's managed to pull through and not everyone has that luxury and it's better for someone to be educated about it than not and so maybe that kind of gives you some perspective as to, to how I view his approach to singing even though he's even admitted himself that he knows that you know it's very forced and that he's had vocal problems and that he's had to really reevaluate his process of phonating and things I mean it's it's something that he's had to deal with too all singers do I mean I've had to as well so um, maybe that gives you a little bit of insight and I hope you enjoyed this. I'll be back later this week with an analysis of Jorn Lon since he did win the poll. I just wanted to stick this video in real quick this week. Uh, I do give voice lessons. I will leave a link in my description and in my comments if you want to book lessons with me. Uh, I do have a Patreon as well. If you want to support me, I would greatly appreciate it. Please feel free to click on the link in the description in the comments. I also am on Instagram. Please feel free to follow me there at Zach Ansley Vocals. And if you have any questions or comments about anything, please feel free to hit me up. I'd love to answer your questions. All right, and that's it. I will see you all soon. Take care. Bye.